At some point, all of us wonder why people suffer. Why does suffering exist? Well, how can, uh, if God is so good, how can suffering be a part of our lives? Whether it is the natural disasters that cause the suffering of so many, the things like that traffic, tragic plane crash or many died for another's sin, another person's uh, decision to end his life, or it could be the individual suffering of, of one person with, with a disease that is slow acting and they waste away. To be honest with our faith, to not check our brain in at the door, we need to ask, how do we understand suffering? What type of Lord is Jesus if he allows as such to occur, if he doesn't intervene, if he doesn't change this? What do we believe about God if God allows suffering? To try to get our minds around this question, we're going to take a look at that today. We're going to get our, first start with some assumptions that we share about uh, who God is. And then we're going to look at the types of suffering and we'll see where we land as we try to figure out how do we put together Jesus as Lord and suffering. So first, what, what do we believe? We believe that in the beginning God created us and God gave us dominion. Genesis 1.26 Let us make humanity in our image. Let them have dominion. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, over every creeping thing. So it is fundamental to our nature that we are made with authority. We are made with power. We are made in the image of God to rule over the, this, this earth. I must confess whenever I read this passage that the idea of us having power, there is a certain cartoon that comes to mind. I don't know if you have images of a certain he-man holding a sword above his head yelling, I have the power, but that's what I'm thinking about when I read this passage of Genesis. So we have the power. That's, we are given power because we are made in the image of God. We have this power, and, and then we get to choose what to do with it. Right? Power doesn't matter if there's no actual choice involved. We get to choose what to do with our power. We are made in the image of God, and so those decisions stick. And we can choose what is in line with God's desires, to true what is, choose what is true and beautiful and good. Or we can choose what is self-centered, greedy, vain, and arrogant. It's a very real choice that we have. And we struggle with this choice, don't we? we? We struggle with this choice. We have this innate desire to do what is not in God's will. We call this original sin, this, this idea that um, we are born and we have not actually sinned at the point at which we have been born, but as soon as we have the ability, we're going to. It's just a matter of time. There's no way to avoid it. As soon as we are capable of making conscious decisions, uh, we will choose at some point to be self-centered and greedy and vain, whatever it might be. And every time we do this, we are, what we're doing is we're choosing the serpent's path and we're losing a portion of God's paradise that God had intended for our lives. And what is heartrending about this is, is that Sin is, is never personal. It's never just my sin. When I lose some portion of the paradise that God has planned for my life, it never just impacts me. For when I sin, you get less of a pastor, and my wife gets less of a husband, and my children get less of a father. Right? I'm robbing them, robbing you all of what God intended. And so when we sin, when we take the serpent's path, when we give in to that temptation, we are lesser for it, and we are robbing others of what they could have. So that, that's, all, that's kind of how we approach all this idea of suffering, that we have been given authority, we can choose what to do with that authority, and we're not always going to do it, use that power, that authority wisely. So if, that, that's what, if that's what we believe, now let's take a turn and look at why do people suffer? What are the actual types of suffering we see? We see the, there are the big events, right? The natural disasters that are the types of suffering. And, and why that is occurring is simply because we live on a living planet. We are standing on something that seems pretty solid. I mean, it's not really going anywhere, but we're standing on plates that are floating on a core of magma. And as those plates move and shift, sometimes they shift fast. We call that an earthquake. We are, are in the middle of seasons that change, and so as those seasons change, they bring weather events with them, don't they? Uh, winds and thunderstorms and in extreme occasions tornadoes, right? There are, a lot of the earth is covered by water and there are these huge currents, vast currents of water that move all the waters across the land or across the face of the earth and as at times those currents cause things like tsunamis. 
These are the natural processes of a healthy planet. If we didn't have these processes, if we didn't have uh, earthquakes, we would, the, the cost of ha not having earthquakes would be a planet that didn't move, a planet would be, that co would be cold and dead. The cost of never having a tornado would be never having seasons. The cost of not having tsunamis would be a dead ocean. The, the natural disasters that occur in this world are the consequence of live, having a living world, a warm world, a world that is active and, and living and, and moving, and, and that that's, has consequences at times. There's another type of suffering we suffer uh, due to human decisions. The very nature of being human is we make these decisions and, and then sometimes we choose wisely and sometimes we do not. God always offers forgiveness when we choose less than wisely, but forgiveness does not mean there are no consequences. Forgiveness is, I'm not going to hold it against you and cut you off and never talk to you again. That doesn't mean there aren't consequences. If I go out this afternoon, let's say I'm having a really wild afternoon, and I slam a fifth of rum and go take Olivia's car out joyriding, and I total it and wrap it around a tree, yeah, I, don't, don't worry. Uh, if we stayed married, that's forgiveness, right? Olivia can forgive me all day long. Does that make the Camry any less totaled? No, it, it doesn't, right? God forgives us. That doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for our actions, right? There are always consequences for our actions. If God saved us from our consequences, well, you ever met a child that never had any consequences? How does that turn out, right? Uh, right. It, so that's one extreme. If, if God just saved us from all the consequences of our actions, then... Uh, and, and the other extreme, if we just couldn't make bad decisions, then we're all turned into robots, right? The, the consequence of, of us having the ability to choose is that there are times there are consequences for those choices. And so we, are, we at times suffer due to the nature of living on, on a, a planet that's healthy and alive and living. We suffer due to the nature of being able to choose and we also suffer at times because these bodies don't last forever. We are these bodies. That's integral to us. We have these bodies. And, and our bodies break down, as I'm hearing, and as, as many of you have experienced. I hear a lot of coughs. I mean, we all have these moments, right? Our bodies are not going to last forever. We get sick, and that sickness involves suffering. We, we know that sickness is not God's way, for Jesus heals the sick wherever he goes, uh, wherever he went. Um, and so even when we're sick and suffering, we pray to God about this, and that is an act of faith, yelling at God, whom we believe is against sickness, right? And so if these are the three big reasons that we suffer, and I think this covers most suffering, uh, we suffer because the world is alive and living and warm and inviting, and at times there are some challenges for that. We suffer because our decisions matter, we suffer because we have bodies and interact with the world. Let me ask you, would you want it any other way? Would you want to not live on a world that's alive and warm and moving? Would you want to not have decisions matter? Would you want to not have bodies? I mean, would you choose anything else for, a lot, for your lives? I, I personally would not. But as a consequence of this, there is going to be suffering. And, and we react against this suffering. We, we react very vehemently against the, this suffering. And, and there are two ways I hear people reacting against suffering that I think are uh, unhealthy. Uh, I'll lay these two out and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at, I think, what the scripture actually does tell us about suffering. Well, the, what I hear people talk about suffering or assume about suffering is first that, you know, if I follow Jesus, nothing bad will ever happen to me. Like Jesus is this magic syrup, you pour Jesus on top of everything, and everything's better with Jesus, and everything's perfect, and they'll never have any more problems. And uh, I hear people struggle with this, they have problems, and then, how, how can this happen? I follow Jesus. Uh, and, and then people start questioning whether God exists, or whether they deserve it. And, and that, that's sad. Um, I run into people who believe that God has something against them or they somehow deserve to suffer uh, because God is out to get them. And, and all I can do at that point is point to the Bible and say there is no promise in the Bible that says you're not going to suffer. Right? The Bible is not full of people who avoid suffering by turning to God. There are, the Bible is full of stories of people that follow God through suffering and God gets them through it. 
The second bad assumption after this idea that uh, everything's better with Jesus and we'll never suffer is the idea I hear that, you know, that's just God's plan. That's just God's plan. If something happens and it's horrible, no, that, that's just God's plan. And if that's so, if that's going to be our theology, if that's our belief, then God is the cause of every evil that happens, every horror that has ever ha experienced. And so God has chosen who will die of starvation today. And God looked around and said, okay, the 1940s, it's time to kill some Jews. I mean, that, that's, that is not the God I read about in Scripture. I, I, ref I reject the idea. You know, everything, it's all just God's plan. No, that's not what I read in Scripture. What I read in Scripture is not the promise that nothing bad will ever happen. It's not God choosing which people will suffer and which people won't. What I see in Scripture is God calling people forth to respond to suffering. That's what I see in Scripture. I see God calling people forth to respond to suffering, and I believe there is such suffering in the world today because more people have not heard and responded to that call. I think that's what we see in the people of Scripture. We see Joseph. What does he do? He is the one who steps forward to save people from a famine, a natural catastrophe, that he accepts that he is his brother's keeper. That's back in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 1.39. He accepts that he is his brother's keeper, and he steps forward to serve others. Esther, another story out of Scripture, the whole story of Esther is of a woman who steps forward to save her people. All right. So as we are the people who are entrusted with power, with responsibility, we are called by God to respond to the suffering of the world as Joseph was, as Moses was. Moses responds to the suffering caused by people. Uh, individual people had chosen to enslave the, the Hebrew folks, and, and he steps forward to do something about that. And, and I think in Moses we see another way that Scripture presents suffering. Suffering is not just something to step forward and to alleviate. Sometimes suffering is something that can be redeemed, something that can be purposed. Moses spends the first chunk of his life being raised as the son of Pharaoh. And, and what do you think he woke up on every morning? Pillows and, and linen and, 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 and yeah, it was probably a pretty nice way to wake up. He gets exiled and he spends the next 40 years in the desert. You think he wakes up on linen very often? I'm thinking sand in a cold, cold wind. He spends 40 years in the wilderness, and I'm sure it wasn't all bad, but I'm sure there was quite a bit of suffering. It must have been a bit of a shock to go from linen and being the son of Pharaoh to being out there and being a shepherd all by himself. But that is what prepares him. right? He go, when he goes back to lead the Hebrew people through the wilderness, why can he lead them through the wilderness for 40 years? Because he'd been in the wilderness for 40 years. So his suffering was redeemed and given purpose. God calls him to respond and he is ready for it. As followers of Jesus who are saved through the suffering on the cross, we dare say that suffering can be redeemed. That my suffering yesterday can shape how I serve today. That I will be wiser and more compassionate towards others having suffered myself. And that the suffering that we endure might create new ways tomorrow to go forth and make a difference in the world. In my experience, the most driven of people, the people who are doing the most amazing and innovative and, and, and imp impressive ways of serving others are the people who have suffered themselves and now want to go forth to make a difference in other people's lives who are, who are all about to suffer in that same way. To say that suffering can be redeemed, that it might even have a greater purpose, that's sort of the, this last chunk of suffering in Scripture. We see that we are called out to, to respond to suffering. We see that suffering can be redeemed. And we also see that suffering in some time is embraced for a greater purpose. You read how Paul is planting all the churches and he lists how many times he's been whipped, how many times he's been lashed, how many times he's been stranded. And Paul is not complaining that he has to do this as Paul goes out and starts the earliest churches, what he says is that he is honored to share in Christ's suffering, for he is doing and completing the good work of Christ in serving others. All right? And so when we look at suffering in Scripture, I see that we are called to alleviate it in others. We are called to redeem it and use it as experience in our own lives. That we are not to shirk from it as part of our own discipleship. And yes, there are times when we have to endure it, especially when it comes to sickness. And so, to answer that very first question, what type of Lord is Jesus who allows suffering to occur? 
Well, he is one who walks with us through suffering. He's the type of Lord who dares us and drives us to respond to the suffering of others. Jesus is the type of Lord who drives us to redeem it in our own lives so that it might be used for how we might serve others. Jesus is the Lord who models endurance himself till suffering ends, until he, and that, until he dies on the cross. Jesus is the Lord who tells us that in the end, suffering does not have the last word. And, and that's the message that we proclaim again and again in this Easter season. We are in the season of Easter from the first day of Easter until Pentecost. This is the season where we proclaim again and again that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is resurrected. The kingdom of God will come. Death will not be victorious. And suffering will never have the last word. We suffer here on earth, and it is but transitory before we go to the kingdom of God that is yet to come. Amen.